True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real-life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Heart surgeon Dr. Daryl Sutorius thought he had found a second chance at true love when he married attractive divorcee Dante Britton. But soon after the wedding, Daryl was depressed and disillusioned. Dante wasn't who she claimed to be at all, and she worked hard to alienate him from his children. Much of what Dante had actually told Daryl about herself were lies. Her real name was Della Hall. She was not a college graduate, as she had claimed, but she was a high school dropout. She had a secret daughter and grandchildren as well. And she'd been married five times. Join us at the quiet end for the story of a man who found himself married to a complete fraud. He tried to make the marriage work in spite of it all, but Della had a history of violence. She purchased a gun, and then Daryl began to fear for his life. When he decided to leave, he began divorce proceedings, and Della made her own evil plans to end their marriage and inherit his fortune. So this is a very haunting story. It certainly is. Again, we've got a guy who probably let his heart make his decisions and not his brain. Yes, or other body parts, too. Possibly. Yeah. But this is just a woman, one of these people who's been just a psycho all her life, and it's just fascinating that someone can live a life like that. It just sounds exhausting, if nothing else. It really does. It's a lot of work, yeah. It's easier just to be honest and work a regular job, I think, but Della had ideas. Yes, she did. So what kind of beer are we having for Della today? So I chose a beer from Thirsty Dog Brewing Company called Bourbon Barrel Aged Siberian Night Imperial Stout. One of my favorites. A mouthful of words. It is. So it's a Russian Imperial Stout. It's 10.9% alcohol by volume. It's a black, very dark black beer. Tiny little head. Got an aroma of booze, chocolate, coffee, and vanilla. Taste gets refined a little bit. It's bourbon, some dark chocolate, coffee, and vanilla. This is a big beer, as you can probably guess from the 10.9% ABV. And also, like a lot of the stouts, it's better when it's drunk at nearly room temperature. Not at room temperature, but... So cooler than room temperature? A little bit, but not ice cold. All right, well, why don't you open that up for us? It sounds like a good beer. Oh, I can smell the chocolate from here. Thank you. There you go. Mm. Enjoy. All right, come on over here to the quiet end, and I'm going to let you start this story. It's twisted and turny, just to warn everybody. It is. (laughs) And going through it, even watching stuff and reading stuff, it's a little bit difficult keeping track of all the characters in this thing. Yes. Now, her exes that were abused by her, I just gave them fake names. And I didn't mention all of them. I just tried to hit the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. So it seems to people that knew her that Della Dante Sutorius spent her entire life using and abusing every man who crossed her path. Falling in love with her was like falling into a spider's web. Now, this guy was lonely, and Della didn't come with a warning label. So Dr. Darrell Sutorius allowed himself to be tangled into that web very quickly. Oh, he jumped right in, both feet. Feet first, as they say. When they got married in 1995, he had no idea, none, who his wife really was. Yes, and I would think as a wealthy man you'd do a background check, but he did find her on a dating service, so maybe he trusted them and they let him down. But, you know, many people recognized that something was off about her. She was the pretty second wife of the doctor, but there was obviously something really fake there. Even her name was a fake because Dante had been born Della. She'd been married at least four times before, and all of her previous relationships had ended badly, to put it mildly. Some in some very hateful violence and a lot of property destruction. 
Della's mother, her name is Olga, and she recognizes something was different about Della since her early childhood. Olga had met Della's father, Jim, when he was stationed in Liverpool, England. He was a soldier who was originally from Kentucky. Jim and Olga fell in love and married as soon as they got back to the United States. They moved into Jim's hometown of Oxir, in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. Olga planned to move to the city of Cincinnati as soon as they could afford to do that. Yeah, Olga really went through some tough times as a girl. Her house had been bombed during World War II, and she'd been forced to live in an air raid shelter with her siblings. For five years, she was sent to North Wales. And as a little girl, she watched men with large canvas bags remove arms, legs, and other body parts from the nearby homes. So she was sent to live in Liverpool and go to Catholic school, where she was taught how to be the ideal housewife. So they basically taught her baking, cleaning, doing laundry, cooking. Yeah, you know, the important things. Because that's what she was bound to be. There really weren't any choices presented to her. But... She was determined. Before leaving England, Olga went to college to study business, and she learned to type really well, well enough to get a secretarial job, and she was working in the airport when she met Jim. She was only 16, and Jim was 21. His family was poor, but they were really kind to her. So her parents approved of him, and they gave their blessing for her to move to the U.S. and marry Jim. You know, they had a lot of kids to deal with and not much money, so if they could find someone to take care of one of them, they were probably relieved. That's a plus, right? Yeah. So, and Olga's wish came true. After less than two years in the United States, Olga and Jim moved to Cincinnati. Jim worked in a machine shop, and he made a pretty good living. After Olga had given birth to two daughters, Jim fell ill. He died of cancer when Della was two years old and her sister Donna was an infant. So isn't that incredibly sad? A very young man in his 20s. Yeah. It's tragic. And And Olga at this point was just maybe 20. Yeah, she was quite pretty. So within a few months, she did find someone new, which she really needed because very difficult back then in her situation to work and raise these little kids. So luckily she met Gene Mello, a nice guy, and he became her second husband and he was happy to adopt her two daughters. But alas, Della did not like Jean. Even though she couldn't have remembered too much about Jim, she began to idolize his memory. She kept a picture of him in his service uniform over her bed, calling him her daddy in heaven. And as she got older, she developed new memories of Jim, kind of creating them in her mind. And she began to call him the only person who ever loved her. Boy, that's a tough one, huh? Yeah, she was so young. It's just weird that she would do that. Yeah. Olga and Jean soon had a daughter together, and they named her Cheryl. When Cheryl was a newborn, Della threatened to smother her. And as the family grew, and Jean and Olga had more kids, Della became worse, more and more upset. Her sister Donna described Della as just a mean kid. Della frightened Donna. She would tell her that the neighborhood dog would chew her hands off. Now, this is a friendly old slob of a dog, and the kids played with him a lot, but Della always liked to kind of threaten Donna. You're going to get chewed up. Well, it just sounds like she was always causing trouble. And the really scary part is that this dog ended up mutilated and killed in an alley nearby. And Della took Donna there to show her the dead dog. Of course, Donna, as a normal little girl, was upset about this. But Della really enjoyed taunting her with it. She gave Donna a stick, and she told her to poke out the dog's eyeballs, like, I saved the best part for you. And when Donna cried, Della took the stick herself and poked at the eyes. Donna ran away and threatened to tell Olga, but then Della would threaten her. So Donna was always afraid of Della. And, you know, when she did go to her mom, there wasn't a lot done. Olga was busy with a lot of babies, and she just thought it was, you know, the two kids fighting, not getting along. Exactly. But, you know, even as a seven-year-old, Della was disturbed. One night, she snuck into Olga's room and held a pair of scissors to her neck. Donna remembered Della constantly plotting to kill their mother. 
She even held scissors to the head of their baby sister, Cheryl, and she threatened to twist her neck. So a vicious little thing. Yeah, that sounds like there's some mental health issues here. Severe, yeah. And unfortunately, she didn't get any help. Right. Well, I guess the situation was such that the family is just trying to survive day to day. Well, sure. And people really didn't get mental health help like they do now, unfortunately. Right. Especially children. So Olga just thought she'd outgrow it. Yeah. So Donna, the sister, knew that something wasn't right with Della, but she could not convince any of the adults in the family. She thought Della was very sneaky, but at the same time, Della could come across as innocent and sweet, so she could lay down the charm and skate through. Exactly. That's what she did through most of her life. So the Mello family, as they became lived in a big old Victorian house, renting out the upstairs floor for income. Olga stayed at home with the children while Jean worked as a house painter, so money was always kind of a problem. Donna remembered Della visiting at night with a man who lived upstairs, a tenant, and Della would beg Donna to save her, but then when Donna would try and take her, she would fight her and tell her to leave her alone with the man. So this was just a weird situation. Donna's too young to know exactly what was going on. But it certainly could have been some kind of child sexual abuse going on with that man. Oh, it certainly could have been. Sounds like it. So when Della went on to a Catholic elementary school, the Mellows moved into a small house that they had bought near the community swimming pool. During this time, there was an unsolved murder of an entire family in the neighborhood. Jerry Bricka was 28, his wife Linda 23, and their four-year-old daughter Debbie had relocated from Seattle to Cincinnati after Jerry had gotten a job transfer. Now, on September 27, 1966, neighbors got concerned because no one had seen the family for a couple days, at least. Linda had often been seen outside with Debbie and the family's two dogs, but no one had seen them recently. One of their neighbors, Dick Meyer, tried calling Jerry at work, but that's when he learned that Jerry hadn't been to work for the past couple of days. So Dick and another neighbor went to the brick of home to make sure everything was okay. They opened the door, and they were quickly overcome by the smell of death. So he shut the door and called the police. And police found Jerry, Linda, and Debbie brutally murdered. Jerry had been stabbed nine times, Linda eight, Debbie four. Debbie's wounds were so vicious they went completely through her little body. The police found Jerry and Linda dead in their bedroom, and Debbie's body was found in her bedroom. And these murders have never been solved. Yeah, so we're not suggesting that Della had anything to do with these murders, but they may have made a strong impression on her, because she liked to use the murders as a way to taunt Donna claiming that she had committed the murders, Della, and if Donna didn't do what Della wanted, Della said she'd kill their family too. And apparently there were a few unsolved murders in that time frame in that area. There are a couple books written about it, which is interesting. I don't want to get too far off here, but if anyone lives in the area and is aware of these cases, it is an interesting story. And like you said, haven't been solved. Yeah, other than the impression it made on Della, she couldn't have done it. Well, no, of course not. I don't think she did it at all, but I do think that she was fascinated by it, the way she that she talked about it, and was really more interested in it than maybe she should have been. Oh, definitely. So it shows a lot about her personality, at least. Because this looked like a really proper family, the Mellows. The three Mellow sisters were always impeccably dressed by Olga, And from outward appearances, their lives looked really happy. And Della was known as the prettiest sister. They did have one son, too. And as the girls got older, Della's blonde curls turned darker. And this upset her. Donna and Cheryl began to get attention, and Della couldn't tolerate the competition. So she told Olga that she wanted to be an only child. Her mother explained to her that her sisters loved her, but Della said it wasn't mutual. So Della was apathetic about nearly everything, and she wanted all of the attention, and she wanted to get her way. And when things didn't go her way, she could be very passive-aggressive, and aggressive-aggressive as well. 
So not surprisingly, Della had a lot of problems in her teen years. She had some bad acne, and she refused to take baths. So she wasn't accepted by her peers, and none of the boys liked her for quite a time period. She never went to any school dances or even the prom. And then she began sneaking out at night. When she was 15, she convinced Donna to crawl out of their bedroom window, and they were brought home in the middle of the night by two policemen. Olga, who never did anything like that in her youth, was just shocked by this behavior. She was becoming desperate, and she sent them off to live with relatives. So Della lived with their cousins in Maryland, but then she ran back home within a year. At age 19, she got pregnant and married the baby's father, who we'll just call husband number one, (laughs) to protect the innocent. Okay. So for her part, Olga had tried to teach Della the value of work. But Della was always looking for uh, the easy way out. How do I get out of doing this? Olga explained how working made her happy, and she liked the feeling of accomplishment when she completed a task. Della figured, though, that any work was stupid. She spent the bulk of her teen years in front of the TV, preferring the characters in her favorite shows to her own family. She wanted to grow up to be like the rich women on the soap operas. Oh, yeah. I mean, as a young adult, Della acted like Erica Kane, and she did her hair like Farrah Fawcett. She bragged about dating Jerry Springer, who was actually a Cincinnati anchorman back then. Springer would later deny even knowing her, but they were reportedly seen together at some trendy spots in the city. And she had shown several people a snapshot of the two of them together. But apparently this was, even if they did go out, it wasn't a big deal, and it was something that she loved to tell people about. Because she really wanted to be famous. So Della had a daughter, Sean, with her first husband, and they lived in a cheap apartment. She was miserable, and she did nothing around the house. She only cooked TV dinners, and she ignored her daughter. She had had a metal rod surgically implanted in her spine after she was diagnosed with scoliosis, and she had to be in a cast for several months. She could walk and use her hands, but she didn't want to. She preferred to stay in bed most days, which would be terribly frustrating for her husband and everyone around her. Cheryl was age 17, and she moved in with Della, and Della filed for a divorce and fought her husband for custody of their daughter. Cheryl worked. She worked at a fast food restaurant, and she was also responsible for chores around the house and helping with Sean, the baby, because she would say that Della was just a terrible mother, neglecting Sean and letting her play among bags of trash and dirty dishes and just really not giving a shit either way. She was lacking that maternal instinct. She was. Now, Sean's father complained of child neglect by Della. He said that while he was working all day, Della would leave Sean on her own. When the divorce was granted, Della was allowed to keep her daughter, and she was awarded child support. Well, I think the mother definitely has an advantage. Oh, yeah. You have to be a shitty parent. You have to, to be really to not bad. Get custody. And I think especially back then, it just was not done. No, probably not. Now, three years afterwards, Sean's father remarried and he filed for custody again. By this time, Della had also remarried. This is husband number two, for those of you keeping track. So Della and her second husband lived in a decent house, but Sean was often dirty and had no decent clothing to wear. Olga testified at the custody hearing, telling the judge that Della was an unfit mother. Her own mother says she's an unfit mother. That's pretty good. That's pretty dramatic for a mother to testify against her own daughter. But she actually was worried about the grandchild's well-being. It was dangerous. You can't just ignore a little kid like that. She she also said that Della slapped Sean for punishment and that she was forced to eat her dinners over the sink because Della didn't want her to make a mess. Still, Della was Sean's mother and she was allowed to maintain custody. But, you know, by the time Sean was nine, Della had divorced her second husband and she was living with a new boyfriend. And this guy was trouble. He was deeply into drugs, and they were financially destitute. So Della did sign over custody of her daughter to her first husband and his wife. 
who I guess they were no trip to Hollywood either. Or a trip to Disneyland, maybe you'd say. Or wherever. Yeah, they were not a good trip. They were better than Della, maybe. So when Sean was just 10, Della began taking classes at the Barbizon School for Modeling, and she was more focused on her appearance than she had ever been. She wore suits, looking overly formal for her lifestyle, and she started speaking with this put-on accent. It was like a little bit British, but nobody could really place it. Sean was unhappy at Della's and also with her father and stepmother. So she actually spoke with a caseworker at her school, and she was able to eventually be moved into foster care, which I think is pretty remarkable. She yeah, ended- I'm kind of amazed. <laughs> There's all this custody stuff, and the child stays with Della, but then she gets into foster care. Wow. Yeah, well, I guess when she went to her father and stepmother, the stepmother wasn't great with her either. They had had another child, and that child was definitely their favorite. So maybe her stepmother didn't really want her there. Could be. But she was fortunate after all that because she ended up being adopted by a loving couple and she moved with them to Indiana. She did continue to speak with her mother occasionally, but Della had already moved on from motherhood. She was done with that. Yeah, so at least for one person, Sean, seems like there's a happy ending here. Yeah. She escaped Della. She did. So Della and her uh, drug-loving boyfriend broke up. This was after she tried to kill him. Well, that can really put a strain on a relationship, the the murdering attempts. I think so. Right? Yeah. So one night when he was drunk, Della put an ashtray with a burning cigarette on the bed next to him and slid a lit kerosene lamp under the bedspread. He woke up to a burning bed and no Della. When he confronted her with her attempt to set him on fire, Della denied it. (laughs) <laughs> well, who did? You know, strangely, though, the two continued to see each other. Now, when they finally broke up for good, Della completely trashed his house and called his friends and she threatened to kill them. She also accused her boyfriend of raping her, and she turned him in for drug possession. So yeah. we're just going to take care of everything all at once here. Well, yeah, you're summing it up nicely, but this was actually a few years of off and on and drama and calling the police, it was a very dysfunctional relationship. And after that boyfriend, Della began going by the name Dante. She developed a reputation around the popular singles bar in the city, and she had several short-term affairs. Now what she decided she was going to do was marry a rich man. So she took it seriously. She bought books on how to marry a millionaire, and she practiced making facial expressions and speaking like the rich actresses on TV that she really wanted to emulate. She studied the fashion, trying on expensive designer clothing, and she told the men she met about her extravagant tastes, and she took money from them to maintain this upper-class lifestyle. She continued to call Olga her mom when she was broke, and Olga usually did help her out. But, you know, Della never worked, and she never expected anything but the best. And this really disgusted Olga. She just got fed up with her. And when she was complaining about life in Ohio, her sister Donna invited Della to join her in her new home in California. So this seemed like a fresh start to Della, and she was hoping to become an actor. Donna lived in Laverne, a little suburb outside of Los Angeles. Donna wanted Della to find a job and contribute to the living expenses, but Della resisted. According to Donna, she was working 16 hours a day while Della stayed home. Donna was a struggling single mother, and she couldn't afford to support Della, but Della refused to work. One day, actually, Donna drove Della to a new job, and Della refused to even get out of the car. When she did work, it would only last a few days, and then she'd quit. Yeah, so do you think maybe there's some anxiety behind that as well? Or do you think she just didn't want to work? Oh, the impression I get is that she just didn't give a shit, didn't want to work. (laughs) Well, sure, but there's something going on in her mind that's not right. There's some mental illness behind this. Well, yeah, but I I don't think it's anxiety. Okay. No, maybe not. 
She seems to have one of those personality disorders, which are really hard to fix or yes, treat. Right. Yeah. So we're at 1984 now. And by now, Della was learning to live off of men. She only ate, really, when a man took her out. She refused to cook for Donna or herself. So Donna was just really relieved when Della told her she was moving in with a guy. And we'll call this guy John. So Della met John at the Hollywood Bowl, and she lived with John for close to a year. But during this time, she had become very controlling and jealous, and she had threatened John with a knife more than once. John worked as a stage set painter in the film industry, and he had been happy with his life and his chosen profession. But none of it was ever good enough for Della. She made fun of his job and insulted his apartment. She took jewelry that he bought for her as gifts and sold it. She claimed to be pregnant twice and took money for him for abortions, but she would never let him come with her to a doctor. So there's a lot of suspicion that she was never really pregnant. And she would use this pregnant thing several times with men throughout her life. It was a good gig. Yeah. That's one thing that really pisses me off is when women use pregnancy like that. Just, it makes women look bad, for one thing. But, you know, she was very manipulative. Yeah, I mean, whatever it takes. And eventually, John just couldn't live with her anymore because she was so volatile and demanding. But he was unable to get her to move, so he decided to sneak out slowly without her noticing until he was fully moved out. So he snuck out clothing and spent some nights with his brother. She really had made John's life miserable. She wouldn't let him socialize with co-workers. And if he worked with any women, oh my God, she just became unhinged. She really saw every woman as competition. She couldn't have a female friend. And she called the women who he would work with or talk to scumbags. So he was only allowed to spend time with her. And she was happy to have him take her out, but if they ran into any people he knew, there was hell to pay. So although she had no money, no job, or no real skills, she was looking down on working people. So that just makes her such an asshole. So Della and John broke up for good after Della vandalized the home of a friend of John's. She took cans of paint thinner and stain to this friend's house, smeared it all over the place. She destroyed floors and rugs. She backed up the plumbing and stole some jewelry. There was a police report, but no evidence that Della had been responsible. John thought uh, this was a good time for her to move back to Ohio, and he (laughs) he encouraged this. I bet he did. Now, just a few days after the vandalism, the brakes in John's car failed. Fortunately, he was able to stop without crashing the car. And his mechanic told him that someone had poured motor oil into the brake system. So she wasn't afraid to try and kill somebody, really. It's a very dangerous person. So she's begun going by this new name, Dante, and she flew back to Chicago where Sean and her boyfriend picked her up. Because Sean's an adult by now. And she had kept an occasional contact with Sean, sending her some birthday cards and the occasional gift. But to Sean, her mother just seemed like a new person. She'd colored her hair blonde, whitened her teeth, and she had this fake uppity accent, Sean called it. So then in 1988, Dante met a new man in a bar downtown Cincinnati. Let's call this one George. George is good. So George was 39 and Dante was 38 at this point. She told glamorous stories about her time in California. George had spent some time living in Los Angeles, and he was immediately taken with Dante. Yeah, big mistake there, George. One time when they were out on a date, Dante started chatting up a 50-something-year-old guy. It turned out he was someone she had dated a few times. So she began name-dropping in front of George, and she told him stories of how many other men were after her. I guess she was trying to make him a little jealous. It seemed that there was always a man after her, and this man was usually someone very rich who was offering her expensive gifts. Well, according to her, yes. According to her. She talked about a relationship with Jerry Springer fairly obsessively also. George didn't care at all about Jerry Springer, 
but Dante seemed unable to stop herself. <laughs> For nearly every occasion, Dante had a Jerry Springer story. That's just funny. <laughs> it really is. So George started taking on financial responsibility for Dante because that's what happens, right? Don't do it, George. He bought her clothing, took her out for meals, and pretty much bought her whatever she requested because that's what she demanded. When George got a promotion and was transferred to Texas, he married her, and she claimed to be pregnant, and then she was just constantly ill. She had morning sickness, headaches, and her recurring back pain. And George suspected that she was using some drugs. Now, he only knew for sure that she was taking Xanax, but the way she was out of it so much, it really seemed like she was on more than that. Jill, what did you put in the blender? My Bluetooth earbuds. If I hear another piece of shit commercial, I'm going to scream. That's a little extreme, don't you think? I can't help you with other podcasts, but all of our True Crime Brewery episodes now come with commercial-free versions for our Tide Grabber subscribers. Well, I know. My hate for ads is what motivated me to give Tide Grabber members that ad-free option. If you subscribe at TideGrabber.com, you get to listen to all of our new episodes commercial-free, and this is in addition to our bonus episodes every month. Plus, you get some great TCB swag mailed to you when you join. Okay, I get it. At least TCB listeners can avoid ads. Just turn off the damn blender. You're going to wake up the whole neighborhood. Okay, I'm sorry for swearing. Not a fucking problem. So, as you might have guessed, this marriage was a disaster early on. She complained about being trapped in Dallas and home with morning sickness, blaming George. He did offer to take her out, but she had no interest in socializing with his new co-workers. In their new place, Dante insisted on having her own bedroom, which she called her princess room. So she would go to George's room for sex once in a while, but they always slept apart. And this was how it was with all of her husbands, at least later on in life when it could be afforded. She wanted to have her own special room just for her. She had a ton of clothes and wigs and everything, so she did fill the room easily. (laughs) Okay. The one thing that seemed to make Dante happy was shopping. Surprise. Sure, of course. She bought things on credit, but then would return them before payment was due. She was obsessed with how she looked. She would apply and reapply makeup several times before leaving the house. George had been learning that everything had to be done Dante's way or else. So George cleaned, cooked, and worked full time. If he asked Dante to help around the house, she'd fly into a rage. She said that she couldn't go near a stove or sink because her mother had scalded her as a child. Yeah, so she's claiming some kind of PTSD. She was always trashing Olga, so we don't know if she really had any abuse or not. It's hard to take her word for anything. She would even hold up her hands to show burn scars, but George said there was nothing there. So after a while, he just gave up, and they started living almost exclusively on fast food. So once he was at the end of his rope, George called Olga for help in dealing with her daughter. Olga told him that he should have called her before he married Dante. (laughs) She would have warned him to run for the hills. Poor George. So according to Olga, Dante had never brought any boyfriends home to meet her because she knew that her family would give them background information and encourage them to get away from her. Her own family would do that. They felt bad for the guys she was with. And rightly so. Well, yeah. Now, George wasn't a millionaire, but he managed to be very accommodating to Dante's tastes. She had her hair and nails done at the most expensive salons in Dallas. She bought her clothes at Saks and Bond with Teller. George never complained about her spending. He was pretty laid back and he had a fairly simple wants for himself. He loved to do woodworking in the garage while Dante would watch horror movies and true crime shows. So I think it's funny that she was really obsessed with watching true crime shows. (laughs) Yeah. And maybe she was looking for tips. 
But, you know, she did have a fascination with the dark side of things, obviously. Definitely. And George just wanted to keep her happy and have a peaceful life. Good luck with that, George. So when Dante announced to him that she had a miscarriage, of course George felt sad for her. She was crying in her bedroom, and he saw a bloody handprint in the bathtub. But she gave him no details, didn't go to the hospital or the doctor, and he just believed her. And even if Dante had lied about the pregnancy, he probably wouldn't have left her. He really cared about her, and he wanted to be with her whether there was a baby or not. But after that, Dante seemed really emotionally on edge, and she started complaining. She complained about George not having enough money, and she told him that marrying him was a big mistake. One day, as George was driving them down a busy highway, she picked up a full grocery bag and started swinging it at his head. He's the driver. (laughs) Yikes. There was a glass Coke bottle in there, and it ended up hitting his elbow hard enough to cause a hairline fracture. So she's physically and verbally abusive. And after this abuse was escalating, George realized it may have been for the best that Dante had lost this pregnancy. He couldn't imagine her as a mother, and he wondered about her suitability for marriage at all, really. Then just a couple weeks after the miscarriage, she seemed to take a turn and cheer up. She told George she wanted a facelift, and she was going to sell her engagement ring to get the money to pay for the surgery. So he was agreeable. On the morning of the facelift, George dropped her at the surgery center. He told the receptionist that he had taken the day off and he could be reached at home. But when he said that, Dante acted strangely. She wanted him to work that day, and this made him suspicious. So George drove home and searched the house to see... Why doesn't she want me here alone? And in a desk drawer, he found a post-it note. And written on it was, Dear Harry, if I don't come back to the door, it's because I'm in the shower. Just come on in. Sounds like she was having visitors during the day while he was at work. Yes. At least one named Harry. But maybe Tom, Dick, and Harry. Could be. Now, George didn't confront Dante with the note after she had her surgery. She was bandaged and in pain, and he took care of her throughout her recovery. And after a couple weeks, she was recovering well. Out of the blue, suddenly, she told George that she had been raped by her plastic surgeon a couple days before her surgery. Yeah, that's kind of crazy, isn't it? Well, that's beyond crazy. Yeah. So George is kind of perplexed about this, right? Kind of. He's like, what the fuck? Yeah. He decided he would take her to the police station to file a complaint. But on the way to the station, Dante said she didn't want to involve the police. They stopped for some coffee, and she told George she had a plan. Yeah, so I don't know what that was all about, if she was going to try and get money from the surgeon or what. But she got the surgeon to come to her place, and she called George to come over, and she told George that he had taken advantage of her again. So pretty much saying he came to their house and raped her. So George ran home, and she told him that the surgeon had already left, and then nothing happened. She just dropped it, like it never happened. And George didn't pursue it because, you know, to be honest, he didn't believe that the rape had even happened, and he was just kind of relieved that she had dropped it. So this was some kind of weird plan she'd set up. And I don't know, maybe she did get money from him. I don't know. What do you suppose, right? I don't know, but it's just wacko beans. So in that summer, George told Dante that he had received a business opportunity in Washington, D.C. They were laying off people at his company in Dallas, so moving seemed like a pretty good idea. Dante initially seemed okay with this move, but then she started showing some really scary behavior. George woke up more than once with Dante standing over him and staring at him. And then there were a couple times he found knives wrapped up in newspaper. Yeah, he'd wake up, she's standing over him, and sometimes there'd be the newspaper with a knife in it on the bed or beside the bed. Or one time she was even holding a newspaper, which probably had a knife in it. So he can't even sleep in his own home without worrying. And then one night they got into a big fight over some hair rollers she wanted George to fix. And George called 911 because he was really afraid that she might hurt herself or him. 
So before the police showed up, Dante went into a rage. And what she did is she tore all her own clothing and she banged herself up against a wall. Then she took some soda and poured it all over the white carpet and threatened to get the knives from the kitchen. But then when the police showed up, she just turned on a dime like she was different. She was sweet. And she told them in this little fragile voice that her husband had been beating her and that he had attempted to rape her. So she showed them her ripped clothing and her fresh bruises, and George was taken into custody. He was arrested. Dante also insisted that she was pressing charges. And after he managed to get bailed out by a friend, George didn't go home. He stayed with friends. And then a few days later, she dropped the charges against him. And when he came back home, she giggled and smiled. And she said, well, looks like you learned your lesson, huh? Like it was cute and funny. I tell you, George, it's time to leave. (laughs) It's past time. Yeah. Then there was a time that George returned from a short business trip in late August, and he expected Dante to be there to pick him up. He waited a couple hours. He called her repeatedly without an answer. She knew that he had no money with him, and he had told her that the evening before. So I finally took a cab home, and there's a note on the front door that read, For now, all you need to know is the keys to the apartment are under the plant. The instructions to find your car are inside. Weird. So George and the cab driver entered the apartment, and the driver waited as George searched for some change or cash to pay the driver. All of the furniture had been moved out, too. And the driver finally told George not to worry about paying him. He said, you clearly have bigger problems. And he laughed. And then George found another note on the kitchen counter, which told him that his bank accounts had been emptied and the marriage wasn't working. (laughs) Well, I think he probably knew that part. I think you'd figure that out. Yeah. His car had been left at a U-Haul rental place. So George ended up calling his mother and she sent him $3,000 by wire. All he had at this point was his clothing, some toiletries, and a microwave. So he resigned from his job in Dallas that very same day and left for Washington. That's probably a good move. Just get out of there. So Andante left Texas also. She moved in with her younger brother, Scott, and his wife, Janet. They had a three-bedroom home in a Cincinnati suburb. So they told her they had plenty of room. There's a mistake there, right? Yeah. And not surprisingly, things got bad very quickly. Dante was just hanging around the house without a job. She didn't pay anything towards household bills or groceries, but she did continue to shop for designer clothes. She was waiting to hopefully collect alimony from George, but at the same time when she's waiting, she didn't even keep the house or her room clean. No, so not only is she mooching off them, but she's looking down on them like she's better than them, which is just intolerable to me. But Janet felt like it was easier just to do everything herself and not say anything. She knew that confronting Dante would only end in a big fight. The worst thing was how Dante acted as if Janet owed her something. Eventually, it all came to a head, and her brother told her to leave. Two days later, she called the police and her brother was arrested for domestic violence. He hadn't hit his sister, and Janet had been there as a witness, but Dante somehow convinced the police that a big bruise on her leg had been caused by her brother. Then just before the court hearing, she dropped the charges, but he never spoke to her again. And good for him. Well, he learned. Yes. So Dante's next target was a stockbroker, And I'm going to call him Paul. I'm going to keep with the Beatles theme here. We've had a John, a George, and a Paul. Okay. Ringo's going to show up later, right? (laughs) We might skip Ringo. But Paul had signed up for a dating service to meet women. He'd never been married, but he had been engaged. And now he was in his 40s, and he preferred the dating service to going out to bars and looking for women. And he was attracted to Dante right away. She had a profile tape, and she was very upbeat and clever. She seemed to have an accent from somewhere overseas, and he thought that was really sexy. So they met at a restaurant for their first date, and she seemed kind of shy and insecure, but that was okay. She told him that her father was English. 
She worked as a receptionist, and she really missed her glamorous life she had lived in California. So she was giving Paul the impression that she was really from an upper-class background. She would talk about wealthy socialites, and guess who else she talked about? Jerry Springer. Well, who else? That's their fallback guy. That's her go-to, yeah. Paul was financially well-off, and Dante was impressed with his German sports car. He had a good job at Smith Barney, and he owned a large house and an apartment. So he was kind of what she was looking for. Yeah. But she played it cool. They had several dates, which just ended with a kiss goodnight. And Paul really liked that she seemed to want to take things slowly. He was dating another woman at the same time, but then he started leaning toward being exclusive with Dante. So what he did, which was pretty smart to kind of try out how they would get along, he invited her to travel to California with him for a little vacation. And he learned a lot about her on that trip. Yes, he did. Not surprisingly, the trip didn't go well. Paul really didn't like Dante's techniques in the bedroom. He's talking about he didn't like how she did... How she did the sex. That's what I thought. That's my nice way of saying that. It seemed that she had to be drunk to enjoy sex. Otherwise, she was uh, pretty standoffish and even cold. Nothing like having sex with a drunk woman. Well, I mean, if you're both drunk, it can be okay. Yeah, but but if you have to be <clears throat> drunk, there's a problem. Right. So they landed in San Francisco. Paul had a road trip planned. But Dante had an expired driver's license and no drive, no automobile insurance. This annoyed Paul, but he decided then that he's going to do all the driving. Then he found out that Dante wasn't a very good co-pilot or navigator. She couldn't read a map. She couldn't find their hotel. Once in Reno, she complained about the hotel room. They then drove to Tahoe and stayed in a nicer place. But Paul was not impressed with her. No, I think, you know, he was thinking she was going to be this independent, intelligent woman. But she really had nothing and was just not really fun to be with. She didn't offer much intellectually. She just wasn't the woman she tried to make herself out to be, obviously. I mean, that's how she worked. She was also very demanding, and he was kind of offended that she never offered to contribute in any way, you know, financially. They were on this trip for two weeks, and he thought, you know, I know she doesn't have as much money as me, but at least she could offer to buy lunch or breakfast or, you know, something on the trip. So he would describe the trip like taking a trip with a two-year-old. She talked baby talk to him, even kind of yanking at his pants leg and asking him to stop for candy and other treats. So she sounds like a blast. Doesn't she? She was very picky, pretty much about everything. One night they stopped at a Motel 6, and she complained constantly about everything in the room. On several occasions, she was jealous of hostesses in restaurants or tour guides when they were out on a trip. She acted like she was the expert on everything in California, frequently criticizing others and laughing at Paul's tastes in wine and food. So as you can imagine, this was exhausting for him, and he realized this was not the woman for him. So when they returned to Ohio, he said he needed a little break. She told him that she loved him, but he just wasn't feeling it. He was really bothered because she said she'd quit her job, and she was getting drunk a lot. She would call Paul in the middle of a workday, drunk and acting like a demanding child. It was ridiculous. So Paul tried to pull away from her gradually so he wouldn't set her off. He went on fishing trips with his friends, but she would call him demanding to know his exact location. And they're not even in a committed relationship. No, they're dating. She told him she wasn't seeing anyone else and she was devoted to him. But Paul told her, you know, I'm not interested in marrying you. She didn't like that. So she fell upon one of her old ploys. They'd been back from California for about a month when she called Paul and told him she was pregnant. So he didn't believe her entirely. It seemed really soon for her to even notice a missed period. But she began calling him in hysterics, threatening to kill herself if they didn't work things out. So he's really got a problem on his hands. Then he what, does, and it's, it doesn't sound like he's got a solution to it exactly. I mean, 
Well, it's he's, hard. He's afraid to leave her because he's not sure how she's going to react to that. Sure. But he doesn't want to stay with her. Big problem. So one night, Dante showed up at Paul's door. She left him a card that congratulated him on being a father-to-be, and it included a gift of a baby rattle and two diaper pins. So that's pretty crazy. Actually, she had heard a woman in his apartment with him and ended up leaving that card with the baby things and then just waiting outside, so she was really obsessive. He agreed to take her to dinner one night to talk, and she insisted that she wanted to keep this baby. A few nights later, she showed up at his door with her laundry then, acting as if she was moving in. So what Paul did is he offered to pay for an abortion, but she said no. Then he finally agreed if she wanted to have the child, he would help raise the child. But then he told her he was planning to marry a former girlfriend, so he would not be part of a couple with Dante. Yeah, that turned out not to be such a good decision, because within a few days, Dante was calling and threatening the girlfriend. Then, she finally agreed to the abortion, but she also wanted to have other procedures, and she expected Paul to pay for them. So she had decided that she's going to have her tubes tied so she wouldn't get pregnant again. But what's Paul do? He gave her a check for $1,600. He knew that this was more than the abortion would cost, but he figured if I give her this much, maybe she'll leave me alone. Not likely. And it turned out that a week later, she's back at his door, unannounced, She accused him of continuing to see the girlfriend and told him that the doctor told her she was three months pregnant and her baby was already viable. Yeah, whatever that's supposed to mean. But he never said he was going to stop seeing the girlfriend. Right. But on this occasion, things went even further. She reached into her purse and pulled out a revolver. Paul was able to wrestle the gun away from her and he kept her there until the police could arrive and she was charged with terroristic threatening. She was sentenced to one year probation and paid a small fine, and that was it. But she never resurfaced. She never contacted Paul about having his child or anything, so he never knew what happened with the so-called pregnancy, but he really didn't believe she ever was pregnant. Yeah. While she was working as a live-in nanny, she met a guy named David Britton. He had an English accent and he was tall, dark, and handsome. So Dante was immediately attracted to him, and she felt like she was in love for the first time in so many years. David was in the U.S. on a temporary visa working for Cincinnati Bell Information Systems. Yeah, they were dating, though, for only a couple of months when Dante told him she wanted to marry him. He'd introduced her to people at his work, and they all found her to be cold, and described her as a bitch and a bad choice. So a friend encouraged David to take a new position in Kansas City that he had been offered, hoping to give him some space from Dante. But then Dante said she was pregnant. Uh Aha. The old standby again. Yeah. The last time she was supposedly pregnant, she was going to have her tubes tied. I guess she didn't do that. Who knows, Dick? I I guess guess she didn't do any of that stuff. There's no way of knowing. No. But David had already told her he didn't want to have children. And Dante was 41 years old, so I don't think there are a lot of surprise pregnancies with 41-year-olds. I know it happens, so don't write to me and say it happens. But it's rare, really, at 41 to just get pregnant. Yeah, although it would be a surprise, wouldn't it? It would be. Because you're figuring I can't get pregnant on 41. I don't know if you'd think you can get pregnant, necessarily. But well, usually by that age, be pretty difficult. it would be tough. Usually after 35, the fertility starts plummeting. But she threatened him. She said if he didn't marry her, she would keep the child and come after him for child support for the next 18 years. So this is weird because she promised that if he did marry her, she'd have an abortion. So the whole thing was really twisted, right? I guess it is. Jeez. So she's going to keep the child if he doesn't marry her. She'll have the abortion if he does marry her which seems a little backwards. Yes, it does. But he went for it. He did. They got married. They got married in 1992 in New Orleans. Now, just two weeks earlier, he had started the Kansas City job. Now, his friends were absolutely horrified. They just felt really sorry for David and felt that he was way too easy to manipulate. Well, no kidding. Yeah. Dante pretended to get an abortion, but did later admit 
she hadn't been pregnant. Mm-hmm. No surprise there. No surprise. She was actually 12 years older than David, and he didn't know her true age until the day of their wedding. But David had his own reasons for this marriage, so he was kind of using her too. This was a way for him to get a green card. So the marriage seemed okay for the first few months. They didn't know anyone in Kansas City when they moved there, so they spent their time together drinking and shopping. Dante had insisted on joint bank accounts, however, and of course she didn't contribute any money into them. And she started spending huge amounts of money, and their savings dwindled and dwindled till they had really next to nothing. David had invested in some trailer parks down in Kentucky, and when Dante found out, she became involved with the tenants. She began harassing and bossing around this older couple who lived in one of the trailers and managed the park. And she seemed to really enjoy throwing people out of their homes. She got a real charge from it. She liked to act like superior to everyone. So, of course, there were complaints from the tenants. But it was kind of a relief for David because he didn't like being the bad guy, and she was willing to do that. So but, she's found some useful job. <laughs> yeah. But still, he grew to hate her. She tried to control his every move, calling him incessantly at work. And even when he was out golfing, which you don't call someone golfing unless it's a real emergency. Oh, I could tell you that. Yes. In the beginning, he believed maybe there was a chance that they could have a real marriage. But he soon realized she was very unstable. It wasn't going to work. Yeah, she talked David into financing a new business for her, a home daycare. And she's such a good mother. <laughs> so Dante insisted that they move into a high-priced apartment, and they bought all new furniture for it. And then she had managed to sign up a few kids to watch. David's hopes went up a little bit. But it soon became apparent that Dante couldn't stand being trapped at home with kids. She started calling them monsters. Soon she gave up the daycare business entirely. She took $4,000 that David had put into a business account and used that as a down payment for another facelift. <laughs> oh. Now, not only was Dante an angry person and a lazy person, she was also a little on the slow side. David's friends were shocked by how she couldn't seem to understand simple concepts. For an example, David tried to test her math skills, and he learned quickly that she couldn't seem to calculate simple times tables. No, and he found her elitism unbearable. She only wanted rich people in her life, and even in the TV shows and movies she watched. She just was completely focused on money and looks. And she also had that lingering obsession about her unhappy childhood and how she was slighted. She despised her mother, and she was no longer speaking with any of her siblings. Dante and David's fights progressed into these screaming matches, and they would turn into pushing and hitting, and finally she would threaten to kill him. So he would say that when things were okay, she only threatened to kill him. Yeah, it's, it's a good day. <laughs> I've only been threatened with death. Yes, but when she was really angry, she became more specific about her threats, and she even pointed a gun at him one evening. He was able to get the gun away from her, but then she picked up heavy objects and started throwing them at his head. She also tried to cause trouble for David at work. By doing this, she didn't seem to realize that she's going to hurt herself financially if he lost his job. But she was more intent on damaging her husband. Now, when the two-year green card time period ended, and he's got his card, he's safe, David made plans to leave Dante. So they got in another one of their fights, and this time she threw David's golf clubs into the street. And that's when he told her he was done with the marriage. I mean, you can do everything to me, threaten me, do whatever, <laughs> but you throw in my golf clubs, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's too far. Way too far. So Dante ran after him in the parking lot, and she banged on his car as he drove away. Yes, yeah, so when David returned to pack his things, Dante was upstairs. She asked him if he was really leaving her, and he said yes. Then she ran downstairs with something wound up in a t-shirt. She had both of her hands on a gun inside that shirt, and she was pointing it at his chest. 
Then she screamed, where are the fucking bullets? And lunged toward him to hit him with the gun. So if he hadn't unloaded those guns, which he did because he was afraid of her, she probably would have shot him. Sounds like she tried to, but didn't have any bullets. Right. So he walked away to pick up some boxes, and then the police were at the front door before he knew it. So what happened was Dante had called the police and told them that David had hit her on the head with the gun. She's this tiny woman, and he was taken to jail. He really wasn't even allowed to tell his side of the story at that point. The gun was in his name, and Dante was very believable as an actor. So a restraining order was issued, and David wasn't allowed back in the apartment. By the time he was allowed to collect his possessions, Dante had destroyed his clothing and a lot of important papers also. So that ended badly. Yes, it did. But at least David was free of her now. Good for him. Now, her next husband was Daryl Satorius, and this guy had been married to his first wife for over 30 years. He met Jan, the first wife, at the University of Cincinnati in the 1960s. He was in the College of Medicine, and she was a nursing student. After he graduated, he did a surgical residency, and then he did a cardiac and thoracic fellowship at Cincinnati General Hospital. Yeah, he was really quite brilliant. Hard worker. Yes, but his personality, eh, not so great. So Jen was on staff at Cincinnati General, and they worked together every day. And at first, she wasn't interested in him at all. He was this big, awkward guy, definitely not her type. But Darrow liked Jan. She was just the kind of woman he had dreamed of. Cool, preppy, and smart. He went after her with all he had, catering to her and complimenting her. They had their first kiss on the tennis court. So Jan decided that she could fall in love with Darrow, and they could have a happy family with a big house. Darrow was driven, and she knew that he would be a successful surgeon. He could be giving and kind, but he also did have a cruel side that Jan could see when he is at work or even with her family. Well, I tell you, that's a warning sign, man. It is. Anyway. And, you know, he had issues from his childhood. He was raised by a preacher. He worked in the church, and he was a Boy Scout. But his father, I guess, was just super strict and cold. And as he grew up, Daryl felt very judged, even by all the people in the congregation, and very controlled by this dominating father. But early in the marriage, Daryl was trying to live his life differently. He took Jan dancing on Saturday nights, and he really loved going to social functions with her on his arm. He was proud of her. In their home, Jan organized these fancy dinner parties, and when their eldest daughter Debbie was born... She was thrilled, but Daryl seemed to distance himself. He didn't even attend the birth, and he was a doctor. He'd been at many births. No kidding. So Jan felt that he was really disappointed that they didn't have a boy, too. He was working long hours, and when he came home in the evening, he wasn't involved with the family. As they had kids and the kids grew, Daryl took the family on great trips where they had a lot of fun, But by all accounts, he was not an easy man to live with or work with. He was a moody, demanding perfectionist, and he also had an explosive temper. But he and Jan were able to get along for many years, and he wasn't physically abusive. And they ended up having three girls and then a boy, who he named John. But you know, from the outside, the Satorius family appeared close to perfect. They had a gorgeous home, they drove BMWs, Mercedes, and Jaguars, and each child was given a new car for their 16th birthday. So eventually, they had six of these fancy cars. In her teens, daughter Debbie was kind of a troublemaker. She started riding on motorcycles with guys that her parents didn't approve of. She started using drugs and just getting into a lot of trouble. And at the same time, the marriage started to kind of fall apart. Jan and Daryl started having issues with sex and with money. He liked to watch porn on the computer, and she was just very disgusted by that. So eventually, they were hardly speaking to one another. 
and then in 1991, Daryl asked for a divorce. He complained to her about supporting her, but then he went out and bought himself a 20-foot fishing boat, so it didn't make any sense. Then he went out and joined a country club and began golfing and going on expensive trips, but all the while he complained about bills and about Jan never getting a job. He said he felt like a meal ticket, and he was tired of spending money on kids who had no appreciation. Now, he said he hung on to the marriage for the kids, even though he was very unhappy. He had used his money to control his family, and he was certainly more generous giving money to the son than to the daughters. The son had been sent abroad to private school, and Darrell had hopes that he, too, would be a surgeon. But he was not a good student, and he lacked the motivation. Yeah, so Darrell went ahead and took a trip without his wife or kids to Europe, Jan thought there was probably some woman involved in this. And on Christmas of 1992, he didn't show up for the gifts or the dinner. He did show up later that week to pick up some clothing. And he had taken an apartment and arranged for his office secretary to take care of the household bills. Still, after all this, Daryl seemed shocked when he got divorce papers from Jan. After two years of battling legally, they reached a settlement. And during this time, he had friends offering him emotional support. He had this one friend who was a successful radio personality. And he spent the holidays with this guy and his wife. And the wife talked to him about his relationships. And he confided in her about his relationship with Jan. So it was clear to her that what Daryl wanted was a new girlfriend. Well, sure. This guy's been married 30 years, right? Yeah, so he's not going to know how to live alone. No. Now, it was upsetting for Daryl that his kids weren't speaking to him. His son, John, dropped out of college, and his daughter, Debbie, was working at a local Hooters. Which just um, was very shameful in his mind. Well, of course. (laughs) This was well below what his expectations and aspirations were for his kids. His daughter, Chrissy, had taken her mother's side in the divorce, and his other daughter, Becky, was in college in North Carolina. So, not a good time of life for old Daryl. No, he was having a rough time. He dated a few younger women, but ended up getting his heart broken. He wanted to find a woman closer to his own age, who had her own money, so she wouldn't be financially dependent on him. But he often had trouble finding dates. The hospital staff were scared of him because of his temper tantrums. So, who wants to go out with that kind of guy? Sure, yeah. He had even been brought up by a hospital committee for his behavioral issues. He might have been the chief of thoracic surgery at the hospital, but he was very unpopular and totally lacking in bedside manner. Yes, so the way that Daryl found his dream woman, Dante, was by joining this expensive dating service. He liked the idea of meeting women who were pre-screened, but... They weren't really pre-screened, were they? No, they weren't. In his profile, Daryl wrote that he wanted a woman between 35 and 45 years old with a college degree and some cultural interests. Dante responded, reporting that she owned a daycare and an apartment building and that she was a UCLA graduate. Of course, these are all lies. So nobody at that service was checking any of that. And one of their early dates was to volunteer at the Special Olympics. Daryl had been involved with the organization for many years, so Dante feigned interest. But in reality, handicapped people made her very uncomfortable. And she really had no interest in helping anyone but herself. But she pretended, and he was impressed. Right. So when Daryl's real estate agent got an offer on a condominium that he wanted to sell... She went by his place to show him the details in person. Daryl answered the door in boxer shorts and a t-shirt, and the realtor offered to come back another time. But he (laughs) seemed totally comfortable with her being there. I would not go into a house if the guy answered the door in his boxers and a t-shirt. That's just weird. I mean, wouldn't you just peek through the door and say, let me just throw on some pants? Yeah. That's just bizarre. So as they were sitting at the kitchen table going over the sale of the condo, Dante came into the room. She was tiny, 5'2", 105 pounds, and it was apparent that she wasn't wearing many clothes either. She was wearing one of Daryl's big t-shirts, 
and it didn't look like there was anything else that she was wearing. Yeah, so how bizarre would that be for that real estate person? Right. And she said that Dante acted like a little girl. She played with Daryl's phone and teased him about it. And the real estate agent left, feeling like Daryl's new girlfriend was just a weirdo. When Daryl's daughter Debbie found out about Dante, she agreed to have dinner with them. Once at the restaurant, Debbie was disgusted by her father's behavior. He was just so obviously smitten with Dante, and she was giving him the cold shoulder. So he was just kind of fawning over her. And then Debbie learned that Dante didn't have a job, and she wouldn't cook, and she didn't clean. So she hoped that Daryl wasn't rushing into things with this woman, who also had this strange accent. Yeah, I wish we could have heard that. Haven't you heard people before that do that, though? Yeah, but I mean, there's several comments about her strange accent, so she must have been doing something to make it sound even weirder. Yeah, well, I kind of picture it like that Catherine O'Hara on the Schitt's Creek show. She has one of those phony accents. Yeah, that could be. It's not quite British, but it's kind of pretentious. So that's kind of how I imagine it. But Debbie knew better than to say anything negative to her father, because he was clearly in lust with this woman. Yeah, plus she and her father had just made up recently and gotten closer, and she didn't want to risk hurting their relationship. Sure, yeah. So she didn't say anything. Sure, I could understand that. So Dante bragged about herself and her UCLA degree. And then she came right out with the news. Did you hear the good news? We're getting married next week. Debbie had mentally prepared herself for an engagement, but the next week wedding was a real shock. Dante showed off her engagement ring, which was a hefty diamond surrounded by rubies. Daryl went to his divorce attorney and told him about his impending nuptials. The attorney thought this was way too soon, and he strongly encouraged a prenuptial agreement. What do you think Dante would react to that for? He said, no way. No, she wasn't going to go for that. I mean, that ruins the whole idea of her getting married. Right. So she wanted to marry Daryl with no prearrangements, and she wanted it to happen soon. Well, there's a red flag for you. Uh Uh-huh. But Daryl was so taken with her that he agreed to this. Oh, Daryl. But his attorney then suggested a naked trust loophole to Daryl. Daryl's property would be owned by his own private business. Yeah, but the problem with that was that it couldn't be done until after the wedding. Dante couldn't waive her rights to the business until she was officially his wife. So the result would be that Dante would be given a lump sum of $10,000 in the event of a divorce, and she would waive all rights to Daryl's pension. But she wasn't going to go for that. I don't know why he even thought she would. Yeah. Right? Right. So they had the wedding, they had a honeymoon in Hilton Head, and once they're back home, he showed the papers to Dante and said, please sign them. She said, no fucking way. (laughs) And that was that. Nothing he could do. Yeah, that's just so dumb. Really, isn't that dumb for a grown man? It is. This is an educated guy. Yeah, it's just, I guess, you know, people do things for love. And Debbie tried to be supportive. She really had some high hopes for Dante in the beginning. You know, at least she was more age-appropriate than the other women he had been seeing, and she seemed independent. She seemed like she would be okay with Daryl's surgery schedule. And all Daryl wanted was someone to love him, and Debbie hoped that Dante did love her father. She thought he deserved that. But over time, Debbie began to see that Dante was not who she was presenting herself to be, and she started seeing her as a gold digger. Also, Dante was just weirdly obsessed with her appearance. In her bedroom, she had hair pieces, collagen syringes, and just piles and piles of cosmetics. And she was a slob. There was just stuff strewn everywhere. She would literally spend hours in the bathroom with these beauty treatments. Yeah, and Dante enjoyed playing the role of the helpless, delicate woman. She seemed very formal. She wore pleated dresses with high collars. She dressed like a girl, and she spoke to Daryl in a baby voice with that odd accent. Oh, it just sounds like gross. Now, weight had always been an issue for Daryl, and after a few months of marriage, he gained even more. He did all the cooking, but they ate fast food most nights. He had begun grabbing dinner at the hospital. 
and then after returning home, he would take Dante to Taco Bell or McDonald's and have a second dinner. Well, I mean, yeah, and he's piling on the weight. He's at that age, like 50-ish. So Debbie believed that Dante maybe wanted her father to have a heart attack. He had a history of high cholesterol, and he was getting heavier by the day. And Dante also was very high maintenance, so that could be a lot of stress for Daryl. For example, one time she paged him over and over and demanded he come home to carry her up the stairs because her back was hurting. Now he was at the hospital due to do surgery, and he left to carry her up the stairs. Isn't that crazy? What a nice husband. Well, I guess. (laughs) Now when Debbie was planning her own wedding, Dante resented Daryl spending any money on his daughter. And she would yell at him that Debbie was a spoiled brat. She was actually, like, jealous of his children. Yeah. Ex-wife Jen was surprised when she heard that Daryl was remarrying so quickly. She still loved him, and she was even wearing his wedding ring till the day Daryl died. Dante and Daryl married in March 1995. And at that point, Jen gave up on any chance of a reconciliation and put their house up for sale. Well, Daryl bought a new house for Dante and himself, and Dante spent a fortune redecorating it. When she learned that Daryl was giving his daughter money for her wedding behind Dante's back, she had a fit. Then, to get revenge, she went out and spent thousands of dollars on clothing. Of course, by this time, Daryl was aware that Dante had no money and no property. She didn't work at all, and she never really had. But he was in love, and he was happy to start supporting her. So she entered this marriage with nothing more than a used car. But she really had no problem taking on Daryl's money as her own. She got right in the groove of that. (laughs) I'm sure. So the marriage is falling apart. Fighting was almost a daily occurrence. And Daryl was starting to consider divorce. Now he wanted to try to understand who this person was he had married. Good idea. So he called Dante's mother, Olga. Should have called her before, like Olga said to the other guy. Yeah, I mean, this is after the barn door is closed or whatever, after the horse escaped. Shutting the barn door after the horses are out or something is the case. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) I don't know exactly. Anyway, it's too late for that, but he talked to Olga anyway, and she said Dante's bad. She had six other kids. All of them were kind and loving. Daryl told Olga that Dante was threatening to kill him. And Olga certainly wasn't surprised to hear this, but she did feel sorry for Daryl. Anyway, she told him that she didn't think Dante was capable of committing murder. Oops. <laughs> Olga told Daryl about Dante's other four marriages. That was a surprise because Daryl only knew about two former marriages. Right, and of course he didn't know the truth about them. Right. He also learned from Olga that Dante had never attended UCLA. She had actually had dropped out of school when she was in the 10th grade. Yeah, so doctors and nurses at the hospital began to see something was very wrong with Daryl. He was certainly afraid of his wife, and she was threatening him daily. One time, another doctor saw that he was wearing a bulletproof vest at work. He said he had found a gun in the house, too, and then he took it to the police to get rid of it. He didn't want it there. And it got to the point where his children couldn't even call him at home. She was that resentful of his children. So in early February of 96, Olga heard from Daryl that he had been talking to a lawyer about a divorce. And Dante had contacted the IRS. So now he was required to turn over 10 years of records. And Olga told Daryl that she had done that to her other husbands too. And she also warned him that when Dante saw the divorce papers, She would be going ballistic. She would be in a rage, so he needed to prepare. So she suggested that he move any valuables out of the house because Dante would certainly destroy everything she could get her hands on. Well, yeah, she's got that track record. Absolutely. Cincinnati had an ice storm on the weekend of February 16th. Then Monday morning, which was President's Day, Dante was isolated in her home. She had medicated herself with prescription drugs and ended up sleeping for hours and hours. She canceled Saturday plans and was in and out of consciousness most of the day Sunday. On Monday morning, shortly after 9.30, Dr. Satorius' office manager called the police. 
Darrow hadn't shown up for work, and he wasn't answering his pages. The manager didn't know his address, but the police officer was able to look up the license plate on his Jaguar. He drove through the neighborhood and saw the Jag in the driveway of Darrow and Dante's house. So what do you think about uh, the mother? Should everyone call their prospective spouse's mother? It would stand to reason. I think if you don't meet the family, you should at least try and contact somebody who has been with the person you're going to marry for a long period of time, especially if it's someone you're meeting on a dating site and you're getting married so quickly. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. So these two officers went up to the front door of the house, and Dante answered the door holding her little dog. They asked if Daryl was home, and she said no, he never came home last night. She seemed really drugged and out of it. And the police asked if Daryl may have come home, and maybe she didn't hear him, right? Because they're thinking... She was probably unconscious. And his office was really concerned that they couldn't reach him. I mean, say what you will about Daryl. He would never miss work. So Dante agreed that the officers could come in and take a look around. And as soon as they reached the basement doorway, they recognized the smell of death and decomposition. And they knew that someone was in that basement and that someone had been dead for at least 24 hours. So an officer went down the stairs and saw Daryl lying on the couch. There was a gun on the floor near his head and a lot of blood. Dante had followed them into the basement and she stood over Daryl and yelled at him to wake up. It seemed weird, like an act. So the officers pulled her away as she continued to yell at them and at Daryl. The crime scene team came to the house and began to process the scene. Suicide was the first consideration as the manner of death. But this was an atypical scene. Two shots had been fired, one into his head and the other into the couch. And some of the blood evidence was kind of hinky, wasn't really working out as a suicide. Then Dante was arrested because they found cocaine in her room. She got out on bail the next day, but then on February 27th, she was arrested again when detectives learned that she had purchased the gun that had killed Daryl. Also, gunshot residue testing showed that Dante had fired a gun, but Daryl had not. Well, well, well. Yeah. So the autopsy showed that Daryl's death was likely a homicide. The head wound showed that the gun had not been in contact with the skin when the gun was fired. And also the shot had entered the back of his head, which if you're going to shoot yourself, you probably aren't going to do it from behind. So the coroner's view was that Daryl had taken off his shoes, poured himself a glass of wine, and was shot, not behavior leading up to a suicide. And there was also blood smeared on the front of the couch, which didn't make sense. And his hands had blood on the palms, which would have been impossible if he'd been holding the gun. Plus the hand was found outstretched where the blood would not have landed on it. And there was blood found on the underside of a couch pillow. So experts determined that Daryl had been dead for about 36 hours. The blood that was found at the scene was coagulated and dry. So I picture this as her deciding she's going to kill him because he wants a divorce. And she kills him. And then she's not sure what to do. And she's worked up, so she takes drugs and sleeps. And sleeps and sleeps because she has that dead body in the house with her for 36 hours. So she was charged with aggravated murder with premeditation. Investigators learned that her real name was Della and that she really did have a history of violence. Her third husband alleged that she had threatened to kill him. A former boyfriend said that she had threatened him at gunpoint. Another husband had found knives hidden around their house. One week before Daryl's death, he was planning to serve her with divorce papers and have her removed from the house so she wouldn't have been happy about that. Now, Dante had a serious issue with rejection, and she had a history of marrying men for their money. She didn't testify at her trial. Blood spatter testimony pointed out that the blood found beneath the couch pillow had been recently put there, so someone had to have left it there long after Daryl was dead, and the smear was consistent with someone's clothing rubbing against blood. There was a criminologist who testified that someone had moved Daryl into a position so it looked like he was sitting when he pulled the trigger. So this was a sensationalized trial. It was aired on court TV, 
and as the trial was in progress, viewers called into the network and gave their opinions on the case. This was a dramatic trial with the couch being brought in for reenactments, and observers were also fascinated with Della's appearance. She was allowed to wear her own clothing and makeup at the trial, and each day she had a new high-fashion outfit on, and it was just almost too much, like a child playing dress-up. She didn't really know how to dress for the moment. She overdressed. Because she was basing her tastes on Dynasty in Dallas and as the world turns. Not the best Not sources. real life, right. right. The prosecutor portrayed Dante as a black widow, and the defense portrayed Daryl as a volatile, depressed, angry man. I think both of those things are probably true. Yeah. So the defense brought in a suicidologist from the University of South Carolina. That's what he called himself, but it was kind of a new thing. I don't know how legitimate it is. Yeah. Well, he wasn't a very good expert. He described the most common predictors of suicide. Depression, alcohol abuse, suicide thoughts, hopelessness, work problems, money problems, marriage problems, stressful life events, physical problems, family pathology, and anger. Now, he was able to connect all these predictors to Daryl's life at the time of his death. And he also suggested that Daryl may have tried to make his suicide look like a homicide because of the stigma attached to suicide. So what do you think about that idea? Is that possible? I mean, is a homicide really that much better as far as stigma goes? Well, I guess there is that stigma of suicide. Yeah, but homicide's not great either. No. There's still publicity about it. Yeah, I just think that that's not very likely that he would do that. So the questions on cross by the prosecutor to this guy were really cutting. The expert had very little information about exactly what was going on with Daryl. Dante had told people that Daryl was an alcoholic, but then others in his life never saw him drink to excess. His testimony was undermined and ended up being damaging to Dante's defense, actually. So it kind of backfired on them. In his closing statement, the prosecutor talked about the motive for the murder, including the divorce. And while Daryl was working on divorce papers with his lawyer, the prosecutor said, Dante was out buying a gun and planning his murder. He called her cold, calculating, and absolutely capable of killing. So Della or Dante, was found guilty of the murder of Daryl Sartorius on June 7, 1996. She cried quietly as the verdict was read to the courtroom. And two weeks later, she was given the maximum sentence, which required her to serve at least 20 years in prison before being eligible for parole. The judge called Della's sentence something she had earned for the first time in her life. She appealed a conviction in 1997 based on the jury being allowed to hear hearsay evidence of statements allegedly made by Daryl himself. Her appeal was declined, and she continued her sentence at the Ohio Reformatory for Women. She was on kitchen duty and had a lot of back pain because she had to stand for long hours. She died of natural causes while in prison. This was in November of 2010. That's when she was 60 years old. Yes, I'm not sure what she died of exactly. Oh, see, I was going to ask you what were these natural causes. Yeah, I'm thinking cancer, but I don't know. So our sources for this case were the Court TV archives. There's a Dateline episode titled The Doctor's Wife. There's a book titled Della's Web that was written in 2002 by Aphrodite Jones. Forensic Files has a show on this case called Second Shot at Love, and there's also a lot of information in the Cincinnati Post archives. So our music was written and produced by Tristan Capel. Thank you, Tristan. And let's go ahead and go straight to feedback. I don't feel like trying to sell anything today. Okay, and I have a voicemail and a couple emails. And the voicemail is from Lynette. She has a case suggestion. Hello, Dick and Jill. My name's Lynette, and I have a case suggestion for you. It's the murder of Sherry Black. The case made international news because she was uh, the mother of uh, 
Heidi Black Miller, whose husband's family owns the Utah Jazz, and Heidi was uh, a neighbor. They lived around the corner up a few doors from me growing up. I went to school with Heidi, and I've hesitated about calling you about the case to ask you to do it because there hasn't been any resolution until yesterday when an arrest was made based on a DNA match and when the subject was confronted, he confessed to having committed the murder. The The confessed killer is Adam Derbero, who also lived, well, he didn't live, but his, his parents' family lived two blocks from me, and I went to school with uh, two of the younger siblings. So it's a very personal case for me because uh, I know more than one party involved in it. And one thing that you might find interesting, you did a case uh, a few months ago about a woman whose daughter was killed and, and at some point she was uh, trying to find somebody who matched the phenotype based on DNA left at the, the crime scene. I think it was in Kentucky. And the mother started scouring yearbooks to, to find the guy, but it turned out to be a false lead because the killer left the blood I mean, the guy wasn't the killer, but he left the blood a few days before the, the murder. And I phoned in a tip to the police about checking against yearbooks, and they had already checked the yearbooks for my ma alma mater. But I think they went and checked the alma mater or the uh, school that the students started going to when the, they were getting ready to close my, my alma mater. So it may be that your, your, previous case uh, provided the inspiration to uh, get the resolution on this case. I don't have any beer recommendations for you because I'm a teetotaler. So uh, thanks for all your hard work. Bye. Well, thank you very much, Lynette. That sounds fascinating. Doesn't it? It really it's does. It's got our favorite stuff in there, DNA. Yes, I definitely would like to find out more about that. Plus, it's one I've never heard of, so that's always... Right. I always think it's important to do some lesser-known cases. So we'll definitely look into that, Lynette. Thank you so much. Oh, we, we definitely want to because the, this case went unsolved for 10 years. And it, what I was reading sounded just kind of accidental that they found this DNA that matched DNA from the crime scene. Mm. And then when they talked to the person, Dubereau, he confessed. Well, if you're confronted with your DNA and you did it. Yeah. What not, else are you going to do, really? Not much else you can do. I don't think but so. But it, it looked pretty interesting, so. All right, great. So next we have a case suggestion from Tanya. You want me to take this one? Sure. Hey, guys, I recently heard a very shortened version of the story about Dr. Joseph Sanier, and man, is it fascinating. Both he and his ex-wife were murdered due to their new romantic choices. His murder is filled with weird plots, twists, and stalking. I couldn't find anything where you'd already done this one, and if you have not, I'd consider looking into this twisted tale of murder. So what do we know about it, Dick? I've never heard of it. Hadn't either, and I, I couldn't find anything about the ex-wife being murdered, but what I did have in my quick look, in 2012, Dr. Sonnier, who was a pathologist in Lubbock, Texas, was murdered in his home. Dr. Thomas Dixon who was a plastic surgeon in Amarillo, was convicted of the murder in 2015. Allegedly, he hired a hitman to kill Sonnier, who was dating an ex-girlfriend of his. So he got convicted, but then the conviction was overturned in 2018. He's out of jail on bond and is awaiting retrial. That does sound like a twisty story. Doesn't it? Let's look and, into that one. And I haven't even looked that closely, so I think there's obviously a lot more to find out. Yeah, there is. I'm thinking there was a case recently I was reading about a plastic surgeon, but I think this is a different one, so never mind. Okay. <laughs> All right, why don't you read our next case suggestion from Jeff? Jeff has a suggestion. It's, he says, I enjoy your podcast and the banter between the two of you. He also likes our commercials. Huh. Well, we try and make them a little entertaining because we know that commercials usually aren't fun. I was wondering if you've talked ever about the newlywed cliffside death in Homer, Alaska. And he gives us a link to an NBC television article. I don't think I've ever heard of that. No, but we certainly have covered some cases where a spouse falls off a cliff. 
It's almost always a woman, too, that yeah. goes over the edge. So I'm not going to give it away too much. I'll just say that in 1997, Wanda and Jay Darling were on their honeymoon in Homer, Alaska, and she fell a thousand feet to her death off of a cliff. Thousand feet? That is really high. Yep. Wow. And, and you can guess the rest of the story. <laughs> so I'm well, gonna, I'm not gonna leave completely, it but yeah, on their honeymoon. That's fascinating to me. Yeah. Well, they they got married. This is like four months into marriage. Okay. And, and they had relocated to Alaska, and they went on a little honeymoon trip. That's still pretty early on to want to kill your spouse. Isn't it? Yes. Well, great case suggestions. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you, Jeff stuff. and Tanya and Lynette. Thank you very much. Anything else to say today, Dickie? No, I noticed, though, that there's still some of that beer left. Oh, well, you can have it. It's a little strong for me. Maybe I'll share it with one of the dogs. Only kidding. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for listening, and stay happy and safe. We will see you next time at the quiet end. we got seats saved for you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.